Hi, I'm Tammy Crable. I've been the garden manager here at the Studio Garden since last October, and one of the first projects I got to build in the garden was this rustic bridge. Rustic structures became popular in the Victorian era, and we built this bridge in celebration of the Oklahoma Centennial. We built this bridge out of eastern red cedar. Uh, one of the reasons we did that is because it's pretty uh, resistant to rot and weathering, and uh, it's very available locally. Most people consider cedars in the area a weed tree, so they're pretty easy to get if you know someone with a little bit of property. Ask before you go get it. Uh, we peeled the bark off of the trees here uh, to help them weather better and survive longer. One of the reasons is because borers get under the bark of the cedar and sculpt around in there and really uh, diminish the integrity of the wood. Some people really like the way that looks, but it's safer and stronger if you get the bark off before they sit around too long. We used a lot of methods to get the bark off the trees. We unfortunately started peeling them in January, so that's the worst time to try to peel the bark off any tree. It was really tough. So I got to learn what a draw knife was. I'd never seen one before, but this really saved us a lot of time. Uh, as you see, it's two handles with the blade in the middle, and you just draw it down the log to peel the bark off. Another way I like to peel the bark off is a, a putty knife. It's one of my favorites. Be sure to wear gloves, though, because it, you'll probably peel the skin off your knuckles on these knobs that grow on the cedar tree. Another thing that you might, might want to consider is this is not dimension lumber. So, <laughs> nothing is the same. From the top to the bottom, the diameter of those logs changes by several inches. So, you need a variety of hardware and tools that you might not have. So, you might want to just buy a selection and guess what sizes you'll need. You may need to take a couple of trips to the hardware store. But these, uh, we used lag bolts and carriage bolts on our bridge to hold it all together. Another thing that we did, we were replacing the deck on the barn, so we used the old barn decking as the decking on our bridge. It's very rustic. When we went to look for details on the bridge, I like to find things, there are a lot of different ways you can do this, of course, but we did just the branches. And this is a whole branch that we put in here, but find one that fans out and then you can attach it to your post at the top and the bottom. And, as you see, it's not straight. So it's a lot more fun. These structures really become more a work of art than architecture because you get to use your imagination. Uh, some of the other things that we did were while this branch was still green, we wrapped it around the pole and just used some finish nails to attach it, just as another decorative element. Then this is, of course, a covered bridge, so we used smaller, bridge, or smaller uh, pieces of twigs on the top and just decoratively attach them to the top. And really, this is one of the greatest views from down here at the bottom. One thing you want to consider when you're building a structure like this is location. Always call Oki and find out where your utility lines are, and be sure you pay attention to overhead lines. When we built this bridge, we sunk these posts in the ground three feet. There's about six inches of gravel at the bottom, and then we filled the holes up with sand. There's a study that says termites won't build tunnels in 16 grit sand, so we're hoping that that'll deter our termites. Another thing to consider is the view. When you build a structure in your yard, you want to be sure you pay attention to how it looks from the house and the views from the structure. If you have a gazebo or a bench or something, what do you look at when you sit in it? I realize this is a really big project to start with, but there are a lot of smaller projects you can do at home. And there are great resources out there. The Stillwater Public Library, for instance, has books on rustic structures, twiggeries, bent wood structures, and even driftwood furniture. This was a project that was in one of the books that I found at the library. You can also go online and use any of those keywords to find a lot more ideas. This is a pretty simple structure. It's basically built with three sticks with forks at the top. I went out this morning and cut some cedar sticks just to give you an idea. But these sticks, <laughs> I probably should have cut all the little twigs off of them. These sticks are basically cut off, joined in the middle, and then the forks make the basin for your bird bath. So if we look at this one, you can get an idea of how that's put together. All we did 
was crisscross them in the middle and then drill pilot holes because your wood will split when you try to drill a screw through these smaller twigs. So drill a pilot hole, screw these together. One thing that I like to use when I'm trying to hold these with only the two hands I have are bungee cords. They really make a difference when you're trying to get things in place and drill the, the holes or screw in the screws at the same time. But this is just equally separated and <laughs> then I put the vine around the top. You take a shorter pieces and drill them in to, to hold your forks apart and just set your bird bath in it. I did try to level it out a little bit as I was building it, but fortunately uh, you can move your bird bath around a little bit at the same time and, and get your water level in it. You could use a wok, you could put a pot, you can do almost anything in here. If you're going to make it a pot holder, I would suggest that you use bigger twigs so that it's more stable because when you get a pot with the soil in it, it's really going to be heavy. But this and many other projects you can do at home with materials you can find in your own backyard or maybe your neighbor and just have a good time. Well, we certainly welcome Tammy and we're glad she's here. Well, with Tammy in the position of our studio garden manager, you may be wondering what happened to Laura Payne, who has been our studio garden manager since 2001. Well, Laura is still around, and Laura is here to tell us about her new position. Hey, Laura. Hey, Steve. How are you? Good to see you. Good well, to Laura, be here. your your new position, you will be working with uh, Oklahoma Gardening, and right. what exactly are you going to be doing these days? Well, what I've done is taken over the position as volunteer coordinator. And so I work with our ambassador program, which we have about 45 ambassadors right now, and they are our big resource for everything we do out here at the garden. Okay. And um, since we are expanding the gardens, we are going to be taking on new class again next year. And with that expansion, we are also getting an entrance off of the highway with this new road construction that's going on up there on 51. And with that will be a lot of funding opportunities for the public, the community, to come in and help us build our road from 51 down to the gardens. Outstanding. So you're recruiting new volunteers and uh, setting up the training for our volunteer program. Right. And uh, you'll also training. be doing a few other things uh, for Oklahoma Gardening. Right. I am the field resources coordinator for Oklahoma Gardening. And in that capacity, I go out and I uh, coordinate a lot of our out of town shoots and any other kind of resources and materials we need for the show. Okay. Well, congratulations, Laura, Thank on you. your new position. Glad Thank to have you on board in this capacity. Thanks. Well, I certainly appreciate Laura and the work that she's done for Oklahoma Gardening through the years. I'd also like to thank Kevin Gregg, our director and videographer, Stephanie Larimore, our extension administrative assistant, the Department of Horticulture, David Hillock, our consumer horticulturist, our wonderful group of ambassadors, and all of the horticulture students that have worked for Oklahoma Gardening during the years I have been host of the program. I'd also like to thank my wife, Ruth, for her wonderful support through the years, and also all the guests that we've had on Oklahoma Gardening the last seven seasons. Thank you all for making this such a wonderful position to, uh, to be in. Well, if you're wondering what I'm going to be doing now that I'm stepping down as host of the program, I have begun my own specialty nursery. It's called Bustani Plant Farm. And if you want, you can check out my website at uh, www.bustaniplantfarm.com and see all the things that uh, I'm going to be doing if you want to keep up with me. But the nursery is a specialty plant nursery. We will be offering unique plants that are heat tolerant, really good for planting in Oklahoma and the South, and a lot of really unique plants. And I've got just a few right here. This is a woody species of morning glory or Ipomea. This comes from Kenya. This is a plant that uh, we are evaluating out at the nursery. It's Ipomea jagerii, large dark pink flowers you can see here, narrow willow-like leaves and uh, makes a woody stem. Beautiful tropical plant for uh, gardens and containers. And right here is a native plant. This is a butterfly pea. Native plants are, of course, one of the, uh, the items that uh, I'll be specializing in at my new nursery. This is a uh, spurred butterfly pea, very popular in European gardens, but uh, 
not all that uh, present in a lot of Oklahoma gardens, yet it is one of our native hardy perennial vines. And then just a lot of unique plants like the, the variegated lamb's ears here, tough as the other lamb's ears, but this beautiful variegation in the foliage. Just a sample of some of the plants that I'll be carrying at my new nursery in my post Oklahoma gardening career. Well, I've got one other person I'd like to introduce to you today. Well, taking over as the 10th host of Oklahoma gardening in its 32 years is Kim Rebeck. Hey, Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you here. Kim, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, sure. I recently moved here from Michigan, where I worked with the Master Gardener program at Michigan State University. Okay. Um, my background, I studied horticulture at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I received my master's degree in entomology from Purdue University. Okay, wonderful. What uh, areas of uh, gardening are you the most interested in? Well, I really enjoy all aspects of gardening, um, but I have a particular passion for growing edibles. So I do a lot of vegetable gardening and okay. small fruits. And I also enjoy uh, flowering trees and shrubs. Okay, wonderful. Well, with that, I just would like to uh, hand to you the ceremonial Oklahoma Gardening host trowel. And I look forward to watching you as the new host of Oklahoma Gardening. Thank you, Steve. I'm very excited to be a part of Oklahoma Gardening, but that's all the time we have this week. Be sure to tune in next week for my first episode of Oklahoma Gardening. We have looked everywhere actually for the best host for Oklahoma Gardening and finally found that the one that we feel is the most qualified is, is really Steve Owens, who's our studio garden manager. And so Steve, I want to welcome you to Oklahoma Gardening well, thank you as the new much. host. Hello, welcome to this week's edition of Oklahoma Gardening. I'm your host, Steve Owens. On today's show, we begin our series of gardening in southwestern Oklahoma. In the last four years, when we've brought you gardens from the four corners of Oklahoma, we've always featured some of the natural areas and some of the native plants from these regions. ...up and swept away by giant pterodactyls or pteranodons. We don't have any of those mean, meat-eating dinosaurs lurking around our garden. I highly recommend a trip here to Boochart Gardens. It's on Vancouver Island near Victoria, just a short ferry trip over from Vancouver, Canada. You know, I, I got this last spring and okay. I really like this brand. So, so what do you think about it? Um, the brand is okay. I love that it's oil free. I love that it has the UVA and the UVB, but if it was last year's, throw it out. Okay. It's not any good. Thanks, Steve Owens from Oklahoma Gardening Television. Welcome to the Deep South. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, I'm truly enjoying my time here in beautiful Mississippi. Well, I'm uh, glad that you're here. Make sure you read the label to see if poison ivy is labeled on the label. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, uh, can you tell me about uh, maybe this one right up here? That is a pagoda. Uh, Japanese pagoda. No, no, no. Yeah, pagoda, pagoda tree. Pagoda tree? Yeah. Off of your head and your face. If there are any little breathing hose, you can just put a piece of tape over those. Turn off those fingers. Hand handle. That's where we'll be, be visiting with some viburnum, and they've done quite a few things to their gardens lately. Hello, and welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today, we're coming to you live from, not live, we're not live. <laughs> you've enjoyed this episode and be sure and come back next week to see what we have in store for you. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm your host, Steve Owens.
You may obtain more information, show notes, plant lists, and fact sheets by visiting our website at www.oklahomagardening.okstate.edu or by contacting your local OSU Extension office. Copies of this Oklahoma Gardening are available on DVD at a cost of $15 per episode.